Hey guys, we are Sean and Chrissy. This is Long Long Honeymoon, and this week we're talking boondocking etiquette for newbies. Boondocking, quite simply, is RV camping off the grid. It's typically free. There are typically no hookups involved. No water, no power, no sewer. It actually can be some of the most beautiful and rewarding RV camping that you can do. We do have videos that discuss how to find boondocking sites and tips for boondocking. So we'll link those videos down below this one. So you can boondock in a lot of places in the country, including Bureau of Land Management land. These are the beautiful natural areas that are federal government property where you can pretty much drop your anchor anywhere you please and camp overnight. Sometimes it's called dispersed camping. You can also boondock on U.S. forestry land sometimes. Sometimes those are in more like designated campsites. But again, it is boondocking. There's no hookups of any sort. And we're also going to talk about overnight parking, which is a form of boondocking. When you overnight park at a Walmart parking lot mm -hmm. or a Cracker Barrel. Why are we talking about etiquette? Well, in the past, year, more and more people have gotten RVs and have gotten out there to enjoy our country, and that's wonderful. Basically, yeah. a lot of people have been out there boondocking in places, not showing good etiquette, and they're going to screw it up for the rest of us because it's starting to cause problems within the Bureau of Land Management System, within U.S. Forestry Service systems. So we want to nip it in the bud. I say this calls for action, and now, nip it in the bud. First of all, you need to be aware of what's permitted where you are boondocking. Yes. In other words, is boondocking okay? Mm -hmm. There are some places where you can overnight park and boondock for, say, 24 hours. Some places it's merely overnight, so it might be 12 hours. Other places, like Quartzsite, Arizona, it's 14 days in one location. Mm -hmm. But you need and to be aware of those expectations when you choose your site. Some of those places, like Quartzsite, also have like long-term stay areas, and those areas is our boondocking, but you have to pay for it. It's a nominal fee usually for the amount of time because you can stay for like three or four months, but it'll be like, I don't know, 150 bucks for four months. So let's talk about choosing a campsite or camping location. If you pull into a really nice scenic boondocking area and you see one other RV <laughs> and it's the only RV on the horizon, maybe don't park 10 feet away from that RV. Give them a little bit of breathing room, a little bit of space, because we all want to enjoy the great outdoors, and we all kind of want a little bit of a buffer of privacy, if possible. The point of boondocking for most people is to be away from other people. The upper Teton view in the Tetons, that area is usually pretty crowded, so don't expect to have a lot of space there. But other areas like Quartzsite, you know, you don't have to park right next to somebody. Yeah, it's not to say you can't be friendly and walk over and yeah. say hello and strike up a conversation, but a lot of times people kind of want a little bit of a buffer between their RV and other campers. Yeah, and if you happen to be a solo RVer and you want to be closer to other people for safety reasons, maybe just walk over and say, hey, you know, I'm camping by myself. Do you mind if I'm 20 or 30 feet from you over here versus just driving up and parking and, you know, not saying anything. Because I think most people will say, oh, yeah, sure, that's cool, and not have a problem with it. But you just want to check first. Now, with that said, there are places that have become so popular, like Upper Teton View and Bridger Teton National Forest, that you're going to be next to other people. Mm -hmm. And so I would say a corollary, don't get bent out of shape if somebody comes in and parks next to you in one of those places. And I think sometimes quartzite can be like that, depending on the time of year. It can get very crowded. So, you know, you might have somebody a little closer to you than normal with boondocking. And then I think in the Badlands, you know, people were a little closer together at some of those BLM spots. So it really just depends. If it's a really high trafficked area, don't be shocked if somebody does get closer to you. But if you're out and you're like the only camper, somebody should not come and park immediately next to you. <laughs> Now, we've had a lot of questions about generator use in these boondocking areas. For example, what are the rules regarding the use of a gasoline-powered generator in Bureau of Land Management land? Well, pretty much there are no generator rules. In other words, in theory, you could <laughs> break out the construction-grade open-frame generator 
that sounds like a jackhammer, but we strongly encourage you not to do so. These days, you have more choice of portable inverter generators that are relatively quiet than ever before. The price has come way down on these over the past decade, and you can pick one up for a few hundred bucks that will be much, much more quiet than those open frame generators. Try to be courteous of your neighbors. Generator sounds, as all sounds, do carry in open spaces, so be aware of that and be mindful of that when you go to crank your generator. So don't crank it at, you know, six in the morning. Don't run it at midnight. Pretend like you're in a campground for those purposes and try not to crank it before 8 a.m. and don't run it later than like 8 p.m. if you can help it. Also, don't run it all day long if you don't absolutely have to. And something you can do to even further minimize the noise your generator might be producing is to orient the exhaust away from other people mm -hmm. and maybe even place the generator on the opposite side of your RV rig you know, pointed in the opposite direction, because that can make a big difference in the overall noise level and Absolutely. output of a generator. Sound does carry in these open areas, and so that means if you're playing music, don't blast it because, you know, your neighbor might have completely different musical tastes than you. Come on, everybody loves vintage Metallica. No. <laughs> so just be mindful of that. Same thing goes with if you're outside with friends or family. Try not to be crazy loud. I mean, we know everybody's there enjoying themselves, having a good time, whatever, but you don't want to be those people like raving at like 2 a.m keeping everybody else awake, unless it's that kind of setting. I mean, if you're a burning man, hey, go all out. <laughs> yeah, in a lot of these places, there really aren't very many written rules. And I think that's great, personally. Yeah. My ideal scenario would be zero rules, but also zero jerks. <laughs> and everybody's <laughs> considerate and respectful of everyone else. Along these lines, we really encourage you to leave no trace wherever you go. If you're in a Walmart parking lot and you see some trash, I encourage you to pick up some trash and put it in a trash receptacle, even if you didn't throw out the trash. Yes. Because we're going to lose a lot of these overnight parking opportunities if people are not respectful and courteous. It only takes a few bad apples to ruin it for everybody else. And so that's why we're saying if you do see trash, pick it up, take it with you. Even if you didn't drop it, it's just the right thing to do to try to make things better. And so it doesn't ruin it for the rest of us. We saw tons of trash in the national parks last year in campgrounds. People were throwing trash in fire rings. They were putting trash in like the bear boxes where you put your food to keep it safe from bears. Just ridiculous. And there's a dumpster at every loop. So there's really no excuse for it. It's just laziness. If you see somebody doing that, you might say, oh, hey, there's a dumpster right there. I don't know if you saw it. You can be nice about it and you know hopefully they'll get the hint like oh yeah I should take this to the dumpster but if you get to a campsite and there's trash there pick it up leave no trash behind and do I have to say don't graffiti Ugh. apparently I do I mean if you are in the mood for artistic expression I think there are better ways than graffitiing buy a $2 nature. canvas at Walmart <laughs> look at all this graffiti really deep I mean, why? Really? Don't deface nature. Please don't. This is a little bit disgusting to talk about, but if you're going to use nature as your toilet, don't just poop in the woods and leave it there. Leave no poop behind. <laughs> leave no poop behind. Dig a hole. A deep hole. It has to be like six inches deep to leave your poop behind. Look. Our natural areas are not the city of San Francisco, people. Yeah. You can't just poop anywhere you want. <laughs> and don't bury your toilet paper. You need to pack your toilet paper out with you in your trash. Do not try to bury that. It may sound ridiculous that we're bringing up this issue, but it is a problem. And we have heard, for example, in the Upper Teton View. Human waste was becoming an issue. And they were considering closing it, I think. And they did a fundraiser. I think maybe Campendium was behind it. Did a fundraiser to raise money 
money, I think maybe to put in a vault toilet in that area to save that area from being closed off to boondocking. So thank goodness they did. Thank you to the folks at Campendium. And I think maybe Dometic gave a good bit of money for that as well. So thanks to them. The other thing is, if you have a pet that is camping with you, pick up their poop. Don't just leave your dog's poop out there. I know you're saying, oh, well, bears poop out here and deer or whatever. Well, that's different. That's, that's their home. We're just visitors. So pick up your dog's poop, bury your own poop, and have a good day. In addition to <laughs> trash, graffiti, yes. and poop, yes. you should also leave no fire behind. Yes. You know, a lot of forest fires in the past few years have been caused by untended campfires, unfortunately. Left behind by hikers or campers or whatever. Actually, in our video we did from the Alabama Hills last year, we were doing a video on boondocking, and some people had been camping near us in tents, and they left, and their campfire was still just barely smoldering. We saw them, you know, try to put it out, then they walked away and drove off, and it wasn't quite out. So you really have to douse a campfire to really put it out. Yeah, fire can be kind of surprising in that you will think the logs are out and they could sit there and smolder for hours and then suddenly a gust of wind blows past and the flame comes to light. You know, in the Alabama hills, you're surrounded by rocks. Maybe the risk is not very high, but in some other places that are thickly wooded. And with the droughts that are happening this year, bad things can happen quickly. And it can destroy not only the forest and potentially buildings, but it could also potentially kill people. So you don't want to be that person. So how about water? A lot of people have questions about whether you could dump black water or gray water out in the wild if you're boondogging. Well, black water never, is a no-go. Ever, 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 never, never, ever, ever dump your black water anywhere except for at a dump station. So that's a no-go. I mean, that's just disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to gray water. Now, gray water is your soapy water from your sinks and shower. It's a little bit of a gray area. <laughs> Rim shot, please. Yeah. There are some places where I think you can bleed off a few gallons of gray water here and there. But it's extremely limited. And I'm not talking about asphalt parking lots, by the way. No. I'm talking about Bureau of Land Management lands or national forests. There are places where it is acceptable to bleed off a little bit of gray water. Check the rules before you do it. Because a lot of BLM land will say that, you know, gray water is allowed to be drained out. But BLM land rules are trumped by the state rules. So the state, like for instance, I think in Arizona, they consider kitchen sink water to be sewage because it has potential oils, fats, food remnants, or whatever in it. So that means if you dumped your gray water in Arizona, they consider that sewage because your sink, your kitchen sink is mixed in with that. So it's very, hazy as far as what is really considered gray water and what's not. Just make it simple on yourself and don't plan on dumping your gray water anywhere except for in a dump station. If you need to, bring a water tote with you that you can bleed off some gray water into. You could even bring a five gallon bucket if you had to and put a lid on it and then dump it at the next, you know, dump station that you see when you're out and about during the day. Be very careful about where you dump it because in some places if you dump it, they'll fine you if they catch you doing Doing it. And also, if you've got neighbors nearby, you know that gray water can typically become that sort of rotten egg smell after it's sat in your tank for several days. And if you dump that next to your campsite, one, your campsite's going to stink, and two, your neighbors are going to think, wow, this is really gross. They smell terrible. That is true if you think about it in some of these more popular boondocking areas. If everybody was bleeding out all their gray water, the place would stink pretty quickly. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry to report. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, all right, guys, that was a brief discussion of etiquette when boondocking. As more and more of us hit the road, we need to be mindful and aware of just some basic unwritten rules, most of these. I don't like telling other people what to do because I don't like being told what to do. The idea here is the more of us who follow these unwritten rules, right. the more pleasant time we all will have 
and the fewer rules that we will need. And I think the easy question to ask yourself anytime you're considering, should I do this while I'm boondocking or should I not, is say, well, if somebody came up and did whatever next to me, would that make me mad or would I be happy about it or would I not care? And if it's something that would annoy you or you think is weird, don't do it. So what you're basically saying is do unto others as you would have them do unto you? Yes. That's a remarkable concept. I mean... Brilliant. Somebody should write that down. Yeah. <laughs> Why didn't anybody think of that before? All right, guys. This was another episode of Long, Long Honeymoon, the long, longest running RV show on the interwebs. And we still find new topics to discuss. Yes, and we still learn things ourselves on the regular. You'll never know it all. If you guys enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If there are any boondocking etiquette tips that you think we missed, let us know down in the comments below what's something that you try to help people understand to do or not do when they're boondocking. What's a lesson that you learned while you were boondocking? We'd be curious to know. If you uh, haven't yet, please click that subscribe button. We would love to have you be part of Loloho Nation. And until next time, what do we say? Lo Loho. You know, the only graffiti I've ever seen that impressed me was the graffiti on the coronation chair that <laughs> they use in England whenever a new monarch is being coronated. And that chair is centuries old. And I think about 200 years ago, some schoolboys Oh, I think it was a Western thing graffiti. for a while. Yeah. And now that's why the chair's behind a velvet rope and you can't get anywhere close to it. But it's sort of hilarious. Because they ruined it for us, right? <laughs> well, that's the only graffiti I've ever been <laughs> truly amused by.